So thank you for having me here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm pleased to have learned that I brought the Russian weather to Moscow uh, with me. So that's an achievement of sorts. And of course, it's good for me to be in the kind of birthplace of convex optimization. So that's a double pleasure for me. I'll be talking about uh, a topic that I found out is very popular here, big data optimization. Many people seem to be interested in this. So that's good. And in particular, I'll be talking about a new paper joined with uh, Olivier Fercot, who is at Edinburgh. And this is about accelerated parallel and proximal coordinate descent. So I would ask, first of all, who knows something about coordinate descent here? I just want to have kind of idea. I guess that everybody. Everybody. Knows. So this is, this, is, this is excellent. All right. So good. Who knows something about parallel coordinate descent? Again, everybody. Again, everybody? <laughs> but nobody is raising hands. Okay. Right. Uh, what, what? Okay, okay, good. Good. So, um, so, first of all, I'll just say what the optimization problem is. So, this is boring. This is nothing new in the optimization formulation. The algorithm is the thing that is new. So, the optimization problem is the following one. Okay, Anton is online. Good. Uh, minimize some of these two functions a smooth function and a non-smooth regularizer. Both of these things are convex. You can think of this as a loss function if you're a machine learning specialist. And uh, this is a regularizer. We allow it to have the value of plus infinity, which means you can uh, model constraints this way. But we assume it's separable, so it's only separable constraints and maybe block separable constraints. Uh, this can be smooth or non-smooth. If it's non-smooth, the algorithm that I will talk about is applied to the smooth version of it, using Nestor smoothing, for instance. Uh, so this is the problem, and we assume that this n is really, really big. Number of variables, coordinates, is really, really big. Now, here are some examples of these regularizers for those of you uh, who want to see these. So for instance, you can have nothing there, of course. Then you have smooth, uh, convex, unconstrained minimization, or you can have weighted L1 norms, you have L1 regularized optimization. You could have box, box constraints on individual variables. And you could have weighted L2 norm and so on, all kinds of things. Now, this xi is the ith coordinate of vector x. And I'll talk about coordinates the whole time, but everything applies to blocks of coordinates. So you can think that the vector was first decomposed into some blocks. And then this xi will be the ith block. Good. Now, so this is the last two SVM do. Now, for the losses, you have uh, quadratic loss, logistic loss. All of these things are convex. Some are smooth, some are non-smooth. So L1 regre regression is non-smooth. So it be applied to the smooth version of it. Uh, L infinity is non-smooth. You can smooth it and apply to it and so on. Nice. So. You said you, you know what coordinates and is, so let me just uh, briefly review this in 2D, which will uh, uh, lay down the, the foundations for what I'm going to talk about. So in 2D optimization, this is of course the uh, big data optimization talk, so I have to start with 2D. Uh, so you have a quadratic function, there's this quadratic well, and you want to get to the bottom of the quadratic function, so you want to minimize this function. And uh, you start, let's say here, zero, zero point, and in randomized coordinate descent, what you do, you flip a coin and you decide randomly whether you go east, west, or south, north. Let's say 50 50% probability. It doesn't have to be uh, uniform, it could be 90%, 10%. And then the probability will influence the number of iterations this is going to take. But it works for any probability, any non zero probability vector. Uh, so you flip a coin. So this is coin flipping. Okay, so it uh, took me some time to figure this out. All right. And then you take a step. And as you can guess, 
the step is taken by minimizing exactly the function in that one direction. This is a quadratic, you can do it, it's easy, so you do it that way, all right? Now, of course, if this wasn't a quadratic, you would do something else. You wouldn't do exact minimization. So maybe you would take your function, find an upper bound, which would be quadratic, minimize that one. If you had the regularizer, you would keep the regular, regularizer intact, so you wouldn't approximate that, and so on. So now you do this again, and it just happens you go north-south. Of course, you don't go south because that's up the hill. You want to go down the hill. So you go up there. Now you flip the coin again. Well, in this case, if actually I flip the coin again in the same direction, the step would be zero, okay? It would be just lost step in a quadratic case. If this thing was not quadratic, maybe it, it wouldn't be the case. It wouldn't be lost step. Here's a lost step. It would be lost step. And it goes on like this, okay? So you can see what, what's going on, All right? So just, I don't know how many. I, I have 25 of them. plays no role in 2D. In 2D, doesn't play any role because you have to alternate, mm -hmm. exactly. So here it doesn't play any role whatsoever, but you, can th you should think of it this way. If you have billion dimensions, then deciding which of these directions is the best one or is going to take you billion amount of work, all billion, right? But that you want to avoid that. So instead, you do something very silly, something that is not going to be as good as the best one, but it's very, very cheap. Okay, so that's the, that's the trade-off. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, several extensions of this. So one extension would be, first of all, these things are not just coordinates, but blocks of coordinates, right? Another one is that the function wouldn't be quadratic, but any convex function, possibly plus this uh, non-smooth regularizer. Then you wouldn't minimize exactly the function, but approximation of the smooth term plus the regularizer. Uh, also, I would parallelize this. So by parallelizing this, I mean that you compute this and another processor computes the uh, update to another coordinate and you somehow, somehow combine them. But this is not trivial because just by adding up these uh, possible updates, this thing may diverge. It may not work at all, okay? So this is not easy. If you average them out, it will always work, but it may be as slow as if you didn't parallelize in the first place. So there's this question, what should you really do? Should you add those updates when you parallelize? Should you average or something in between? And the answer would be that it depends on the sparsity and on the f on, on sparsity part pattern governing the function. It depends also on the way you randomize. Uh, another way in which I will extend this is that it would be accelerated in the sense that it would converge one over k squared. So be accelerated as well and also be efficient. So current accelerated coordinates and algorithms are not efficient in the sense that there's a step in the algorithm where two full dimensional vectors have to be added up. So if you have billion dimensions, there's a convex combination of these billion dimensional vectors taken in the algorithm. And that beats the efficiency of coordinate descent because coordinate descent is efficient precisely because it avoids full dimensional vector operations. So additions of two full dimensional vectors that's not allowed, okay? So there's another way in which this will be extended. So I would just maybe then repeat this. So first of all, you can generalize this to a block setting. You can, of course, be just non-quadratic, non any convex function, proximal. So I talked about all of this parallel. I told about, talked about accelerated and also efficient, right? So I just said all of this. So here is a brief history of randomized coordinates and methods, and I apologize uh, so many papers, of course, and very nice papers are missing from this table. So this is not meant to be comprehensive, but I would argue that, uh, uh, that this is enough for the purpose of what I'm trying to, trying to show here. So, so I'm looking at these papers here. All of them are, are, are coordinate descent papers. All of them are randomized coordinate descent papers in various settings. And all of them are papers that analyze uh, complexity, iteration complexity. Okay, these are not application papers. So, for instance, Leventhal and Lewis, they had a paper which was essentially core in descent for quadratic functions only. So, it was extension of the randomized catch march algorithm to the solution of uh, systems of equations and to minimization of quadratic functions. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, not uh, positive definite, but positive semi definite, and so on. They also had some constraints there. 
So there was not a block setting, it was not general, R, general F, it was quadratic. There was no proximal term there. Uh, it was not parallel, only one coordinate was updated at a time. It was not accelerated, but it was efficient in the sense it avoided full dimensional operations. So uh, then there's all kinds of other papers. You can see that slowly this table in all columns starts to fill up. Uh, so let's, let's look at Nestor's paper. So very famous paper in the field. So this was a paper with, at the same time, uh, had the block setting, general F setting. It was an accelerated method in there, as well as non-accelerated. But the accelerated had that issue of full dimensional operations. Now, in this paper with uh, Martin Takac, we had the kind of opposite setting there. We had the proximal setting, general F, block setting, and efficient, but it was not accelerated. Uh, then you have this paper. This is first general parallel coordinates paper, which has all of these except for acceleration again. So accelerated uh, method was not there. And the reason is that Nesterov said in his paper, wrote in his paper, that this accelerated algorithm is not efficient because of this step. So people then thought maybe it's not possible to do it efficiently. So the purpose of this talk is to show that actually it's possible to fill this up. It's possible to have one algorithm that satisfies all of those requirements. And it's efficient, accelerated, parallel, and so on and so forth. So you can see that here, uh, these two papers are block, general, accelerated. So three out of six, this paper, efficient, accelerated, but it's for only for a quadratic function, none of the other properties. And this paper, the approx paper, has all of those properties. So this is the biggest message that I want to get across. Now, plus, in addition to this, we devise new long step sizes for parallel coincident algorithms. And they have a tremendous effect on the efficiency of the algorithms. And these are theoretical step sizes. If there's any questions at this point, I would welcome questions while I'm drinking. So what was the original idea <coughs> in the first paper by <coughs> why uh, they uh, chose this randomized version of So I think they were motivated by Stromer and Vershin in randomized catch march. They're motivated by that paper, which is not in the paper in this table, which is an amazing paper. It's not in this table, should be maybe. Uh, they were motivated by that and wanted to extend that to minimization problems and to constraint minimization problems. So that was the, the motivation there. Any other questions? Sparsity. I, I, I don't find out uh, sparsity. Is yes, it's, it's just not. There's, there's many things which are not here. So for instance, what is not here is nothing about sparsity mentioned. There's nothing about whether the method, the parallel methods are synchronous or asynchronous. You know, there's other things you can look at, but it's already wide enough, this the table, so I, I had to stop somewhere. The main idea of Yuri Nesterov is uh, uh, some kind of trade-off between sparsity and proper organization of uh, coordinate descent. That is, if we uh, choose coordinate descent in a proper way, we can uh, uh, use the sparsity of the uh, problem uh, uh, as much as possible. Yeah, so I would argue that all of these papers uh, utilize sparsity in some way or another. All of them. Uh -huh. Otherwise, these things would not be efficient at all. And there's different kinds of sparsity. For instance, in this paper with Olivier, which is a different paper from the one I'm actually describing right now, we look at the max type structure, uh, non-smoothness, the one uh, that Nestor looked at. And we ask the question, when you smooth such a function, when will that be good enough for parallel current descent? And it depends on the sparsity pattern of the matrix that appears there. It just depends on it. If the sparsity was not good, then the parallel current descent would not work, for yeah. instance. So all of these depend on sparsity in some way or another. It is, uh, you use uh, some kind of function which uh, use, uh, which have, uh, such that uh, when you uh, recalculate the value of function, uh, yes. the value of points is close to each yes. other, then it, it, no, it is not co cost much. Exactly. So all of these share the same property, but there are some extensions to this as well. One, one, one can have extensions of that. 
Okay. Okay. Good. So now the algorithm. So I'll start with the algorithm right away. So you should see what the algorithm actually is. So this is what the algorithm looks like. So it's a very simple algorithm. So, uh, and you may notice the little trick I'm playing on you, these colors, they just, you know, the same colors as here, okay? So I hope there's some people here who appreciate that detail. Okay, good. So this is the algorithm. Now, what does it do? So first of all, it generates random set of coordinates, SK, at iteration K, and it's a set. So it's parallel in the sense that it updates only those coordinates that belong in that set. And that set is described by some probability distribution on the random subsets of the set of coordinates. And I'm not specifying at this point what that distribution should be. What I'm saying is that on average, you pick tau coordinates in that set. So the expected cardinality of that set is tau. And the tau appears in several places. It appears here, it's over there, and so on. Good. But uh, step three uh, can take a lot of uh, times, uh, a lot of... Uh, of course, costs you're precisely uh, correct. So, so the algorithm is general, the analysis also will be general, but of course, only in some cases, mm -hmm. this will be efficient, this step would be efficient. Still, you can analyze it, even if that step wouldn't be inefficient. Mm -hmm. yeah. So all of this is unconstrained, and if there are any constraints, they'll be put into this regularizer. Okay, good. So let's look why this is accelerated. So those of you who know accelerated algorithms, you would recognize obviously the sequence, right? So you can already see that it must be accelerated because there's this like, sequence over there. You can see that sequence affects the size of this quadratic term in this quadratic approximation of, uh, of the function f. This is with respect to uh, block i or coordinate i. Right, so if theta k, it goes to zero, these things go to zero, so one over theta k linearly grows, okay? And you can also see that there's two sequences that are being updated. That's also characteristic of accelerated algorithms. It's not just one sequence, there's two sequences. But you can see that uh, now it's parallel because this step is done completely in parallel. There's no communication needed there. Each computer or each processor can do one of these coordinates or blocks of coordinates. Everything can be done independently. It is connected with Nestor or fast gradient methods. Uh, exactly. So, so accelerated by that I mean fast gradient methods. Yes. It is connected and as, uh, it arri uh, arises as a special case of this. Case of so if you have just one block, mm -hmm. you don't have any randomization because you choose from that block. There's just one block. Then you get fa nest a fast Nestor of method, but you get a special variant by tank which only, use, which only has one of these projection steps here, one of these uh, proximal operators, proximal mappings. Usually there's two, or sometimes there's some averaging. Here is, there's no averaging, and just one. So this is considered to be an efficient version of a fast uh, Nesterov method, okay? So fast Nesterov method is a special case of this if there's just one block. Or if there is as many processors as there are blocks, because that removes uh, randomization again. But then it's, a, then, it's a, then it's a new version of fast Nestor method, which has different curvature constants for each block. And block is a fixed I, yes? Box is, is fixed, fixed I. I, yes. Yes. So at the beginning, I put these things into blocks, and from then on, I'm operating on blocks. Okay? Now, so that's how you can guess it's accelerated. You can also see that when this T is computed, it is just added to these two sequences, that's all. It's computed and then added. So this is not bottleneck, this update of these sequences. This computation of the T is the bottleneck, right? Because you have to write it somewhere and this takes as much time as just writing it, right? Just twice that. So the bottleneck is actually computation of this. And if you look at that, the real bottleneck is the computation of this partial derivative here. Because once the partial derivative, once you have it, this is essentially O1. If you have a block of size ni, then it's ONI. Right? So it's work uh, comparable to the size of the block. Now, what I want to point out here is that at no point in this algorithm you have to add two full dimensional vectors. If you look at this algorithm, there's no point where you add two dimensional vectors. The only point 
where it looks like maybe you need to add them is here in the computation of the partial derivative. But I argue, as, as you'll see, you don't have to do it. It's possible to compute it without adding those two vectors. Okay. Now, why is this proximal? Because there's this proximal term here. Uh, so you would call this xk, and that's the thing that gets output. So if you want to actually output x, then you would need to form that combination at the end. But you never actually need to form it during the algorithm. Yes? Exactly. Exactly. So that would be a special case of this as well. If you choose, if you choose, exactly. So this is composite gradient mapping, exactly. But it's a block version of that. Okay, it's a block version of that. So first of all, there was no proximal accelerated coordinates and algorithm before this. So even those two properties, accelerated and, and proximal, was not out there. So that's also novel. But on top of this, this is parallel and efficient. It avoids these uh, full dimensional operations. Uh, and exactly when you have just one block, and you can choose how you put these things into blocks. If you have just one block, and you force all these theta zeros to be tau divided by n, so you don't update them this way, you force them to be constant, you get precisely that the non-accelerated uh, Nesterov's uh, algorithm. And I can show it here. OK, maybe this is something a little bit different. So there's an, an algorithm that uh, I developed with my PhD student. Uh, and the algorithm arises as a special case of this if you force this theta case to be tau of, of divided by n if you don't change these things. So let's see what happens if you force theta k not to change. So first of all, this is not changing. It's just tau divided by n, right? But since this is tau divided by n, you can see there's 1 minus 1 here in the numerator. It's 1 minus n divided by tau times tau divided by n. So it's 1 minus 1, which means you never update u. Since you never update u and you started with 0, you don't need that u. It's not necessary. Right? So you don't need that u, which means you don't need to update u's. This u is not needed. This is actually 1. This is not needed. And now when you look at this, this is not accelerated composite. Uh, coordinate and parallel. Okay, so it's a special case of this. So accelerated, non-accelerated, uh, in one one framework. So do, would you have any any questions? Good. So now now let's try to get some intuition about this. Because there are these constants flying around. So for instance, you may ask, what is this vi? Right? What is that vi? I didn't tell you what was vi. Theta case, I'm telling you. You exactly know. It starts at tau divided by n. So if you update just one coordinate at a time, tau is 1, you divide by the number of coordinates. If tau is n, you update all of them at a time, then it's 1. Right? So theta case behave deterministically. But this vi, I didn't tell you what that was. So these vi's will be a property of this randomization operation and the function. You look at the function, add the randomization, and from that, from the property of the couple, you get vi's. And I'll, I'll spend some time later on uh, to tell you, because you cannot choose any vi's there, obviously. Uh, how you should choose uh, tau? So tau, this is up to you, because tau, essentially what it does, it, uh, it allows you to choose it depending on what computer you have. If you think you have just maybe one processor, you choose tau1 because you can only pr process one coordinate at a time. If you have 10 processors, maybe choose tau is equal to 10. Or a multiple of 10 if you think that each processor can handle a couple at a time. So tau is the parallelization factor. And at the same time, it, it kind of encodes a lot of algorithms, right? from serial coordinate descent, which updates only one, to the parallel coordinate descent, which updates everything. Right? So, so this is, tau is easy to set. That, that's not a problem. What, what, what really is a problem is this vi. If this vi is large, that's bad, because then these steps are tiny, and you have many of these iterations. When these vi's are small, that's really good, because then 
this thing doesn't influence you much. It allows you to explore the space better. So you take larger steps, and maybe that means you converge faster. But of course, you cannot just set this vi to, let's say, 0, because you never then converge, right? So this vi must be set in some sense. It, it must be set, there must be theory which tells you what the vi should be. And normally, this would be something like the Lipschitz constant, right? That, that's what it should normally be. But now, what, what is needed is a randomized version of that and a parallel version of that. Okay? So what it will really be will be something based on the concept of expected separable over approximation, which, which I will talk about. Step size policy uh, doesn't use the information of uh, the size of uh, in initial approximation. I mean the size of uh, the uh, level set. Level set, yes. Uh, in in uh, we, we know estimation uh, 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 where the level set uh, included in the step size, yes. and uh, your step size policy uh, doesn't include. Uh, so, but there's a standard in gradient methods that the step size policy would depend, let's say, on the Lipschitz constant of the gradient of the function, right? That, that's yes. very standard in gradient algorithms, and that's precisely what I'm doing here. Okay, so that is not necessary. It is not necessary. Uh, I'm not saying that one ah, cannot do something ah, about you, this, you but this is what Lipschitz gradient. You I will have eventually Lipschitz, Lipschitz gradient. gradient. Ah, I, I will eventually have that. Gradient. Yes. 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 Yes, the VIs is something, but it's not actually, it is actually not Lipschitz gradient. It is an intricate concept that I will talk about. Uh, but it is related to the Lipschitz property of the gradient, but of the coordinate mm -hmm. gradients, okay? And not just coordinate gradients, but of, it is, it is, it is related to the random subs, subspaces and the Lipschitz properties of random subspaces. Okay. Uh, not quite, because there is also the uh, randomization is in there as well. And there's a tricky concept. I'll talk about it later, but for now, just think about these VIs that if magically somehow you can choose them well, this will converge well, okay? Okay, for now. But th that's, that's the only thing that is remaining right now. You know everything about the algorithm except for the VIs essentially. Also, what I didn't tell you, how you should exactly compute this right, efficiently. I didn't tell you how fast it runs and so on, but, but at least you know it's easy to code. This is very simple to code. Good, so let's get some intuition. So this, if this thing is missing from here, the proximal term is not there, then you can minimize this closed form if you think this is just maybe, uh, there's no blocks, blocks are of size one. This is what you're going to get, the standard gradient step from zero. So you can see that as these theta k's go down to zero, 1 over theta k grows linearly. So this will go up, which means you take larger step sizes in some, in some sense. That is good. But then you have this term there, which is tau divided by vi. And it's not clear at this moment how this behaves. So here's what I'm trying to say, that if tau grows, you use more processors, right? Tau grows means you use more processors, you update more coordinates. You would expect that the algorithm will take fewer iterations, right? You would expect that because you do more work. Now you would expect that that, that would probably mean that the algorithm takes longer steps, probably. And these are the steps, which means that somehow you'd expect that this thing grows with tau. That's what you would expect. But tau is somehow hidden in this vi's because I told you that this vi depends on the randomization, on this sk. And, and tau is property of the sk. Tau is the expected size of the subset, right? So this ratio tau divided by vi, whether that's growing or not, that's a question. And in fact, what I'll show later on, that yes, indeed it is growing. It depends on the sparsity uh, governing the function. And and the, the speed at which this is growing depends on the sparsity, which means if there is a lot of sparsity, this will be growing fast with tau, which means you get acceleration speed up by parallelization. If you don't have sparsity, then I'll argue that tau divided by vi will not change with tau at all. What would that mean? It would mean that the algorithm takes exactly the same step sizes if you parallelize or not, which means it, whether you parallelize or, not, parallelize or not, it will take the same number of iterations to converge. 
So somehow, parallelization is not always possible in coordinate descent, and it depends on sparsity. Okay. Good. So that's what I want to say here. So let's look at the convergence rate. So this is the convergence rate. This theorem says, and here is a concept which I'm not defining now because I want to give you the good stuff before I go into the technical details, right? I want you to know what actually I'm, I'm talking about. So this is a key assumption here, which is assumption which joins the randomization with the function, and out of that, what, what, what you output is the Vs, the step sizes. It's a joint property of the randomization and, and, and the function. And if you have this, so if you somehow get these Vs, which satisfy this, whatever that means, I'm not telling what it means, then you get after this many iterations, expected values converge within epsilon. So you can see this thing is indeed accelerated because you get square root of epsilon. You can see it accelerates if tau grows. Because if tau grows, this thing goes down, which means it's faster if you have more processors. Right? So it's very clear. Except, except there's this V, which might grow if tau grows. So this goes down, but this V might go up if tau grows, and it may just counter that uh, decrease of this. So that's why the dependence of V on tau is a crucial thing for study. Okay? Any questions at this point? Is a, what, 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 what is this assumption, actually? So, so, so I'll... I'll mention it detail later on, but if you want, I can tell you briefly what it is. So briefly what it is, is, is the following thing. You look at the function value of the smooth component at the next iterate. The next iterate is a random vector. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the randomization and on the function. And you want to minimize the expectation. Now, uh, this V is the modulus of the quadratic function which upper bounds this expectation. Mm -hmm. So it's, an upper, it's a quadratic upper bound on the expectation of the function value at the next iteration. And the Vs will be the, the diagonal of the diagonal Hessian in that quadratic. Okay? Yeah. Um, we consider a constraint optimization problem. So I think that um, constant C uh, may be very, very big, big number because of um, initial Yeah, so that's what you unfortunately always have to pay for. It's just unavoidable somehow. So, so if tau is, let's say, n, this disappears. This is not there at all. And everything is in the distance, in the initial distance, but that's what you usually have in gradient kind of methods. You always have distance. You cannot avoid that. OK, so I should have clicked on this sooner. So this n is number of coordinates, number of iterations. This is average number of co coordinates updated at every iteration. So I would point out that this algorithm doesn't require that you take the same number of coordinates at each iteration. It can be random number of coordinates. That allows you to model situations where you have processors which are not really giving you answer. They're unreliable. So you can model, you can imagine a situation where you ask some processor to give you a result and only a certain fraction with some probability will give you the result. This includes that possibility. That's an excellent question. So here in this work, we don't have any adaptivity. Mm -hmm. We have a follow-up work, which is not posted anywhere, where we do it adaptively. So you can uh, choose it. Uh, it's possible to do it ad adaptively. So here, here we do it, we choose it before. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's important that there is a simple formula for this and that it's not a hard optimization problem you need to solve. Essentially, by reading the data, you know what the Vs are. Mm -hmm. That's how we do it right now. But it's, it might be more efficient to do it adaptively, but we don't do it in this paper. Mm -hmm. but, uh, not, not in this paper. Yes. Do you consider this problem? And uh, do you know some, some uh, I don't know, uh, feeling that this gives better results? Yes, I, I think it should give better results. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my feeling, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. So let's look at the special case when you have as many processors as you have coordinates. Mm -hmm. So tau is equal to n. So there's no randomization in the algorithm anymore, right? So now you should think you have all the coordinates are updated. But in parallel, in parallel, there's n processors. Mm -hmm. okay? 
Now, this is what you get. This is what the complexity is, right? So now you can see there's this initial distance from the minimizer. And that by V tilde, I mean that's the V vector divided by its norm. So no, not divided by, norm, divided by its norm, but divided uh, in such a way that the weights sum up to N, mm -hmm. exactly as in L2 norm. Because I want to think of this as something like an L2 norm. At least the weights should, should sum, up, sum up to the same thing. I want it to be comparable in that sense. Then the Vs end up here. You get an average of these Vs. Okay? So it depends on the average of these Vs. Mm -hmm. If the average of these Vs is small, the algorithm will be, will be doing well. If it is large, the algorithm will, will not be doing well. And as you'll see, this, these Vs will depend on sparsity. And now a question. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, will, give, will give you a nice approximation of f of x. Uh, yes. Uh, of small. And, uh, uh, and this method uh, probably not converged. I mean, it means that uh, uh, not expectation, but f of x hat not converged to f of x. Uh, yes. Yeah. And uh, could you, uh, would you try to make some converged version of this algorithm? So, so if you, let's say, run this log 1 over rho times, where rho is some small number, then it will converge with probably at least 1 minus rho. Mm -hmm. If you just run this few times, essentially, this algorithm, it converges with any probability you want, any high probability you want. And that, what about but it's not a single run analysis. In, in the non-accelerated algorithm, the results that we have are high probability results. You just do one run, mm -hmm. and with any probability you want, it will converge. Here is an expectation kind of result but it can be turned into high probability just by running it log one over all times. Uh, in this method, what is its complexity? I mean, how uh, many times we calculate uh, the gradients of the function for this particular case? Where yes. There's no, uh, so we need n, uh, n calculations of, of the partial of, of the grain or partial derivative? Okay, so I didn't actually, I don't have a slide on this, but you can, you can just figure it out from here. Because at every iteration, mm -hmm. you need tau partial derivatives, right? Mm -hmm. So if tau is equal to n, let's look at the special case. Tau is equal to n, which means in one iteration, you actually need all the partial derivatives, which all means you need... All of them are at the same point. All of them are at the same point. So that's just one gradient uh, then, in that because case. Because the, uh, the original uh, yes. version, it was in different points. Yes. Yes, so this, if tau is equal to n, then in one iteration, you evaluate one gradient, mm -hmm. if tau is equal to n. So in that case, you, what you would have to do, you would have to, this is the number of gradient evaluations, yeah. okay, in that case. Excellent, good, good, all right. So now, I'll step even further, so I'm, I'll be even more secretive right now, okay. So I'm going to tell you that this average of these VIs, if you do the step sizes in, in, in the way that we suggest in this paper, mm -hmm. and there are many ways of doing this actually, depending on the function and so on, there's many models for functions and so on, it will be equal to the product of average of Lipschitz constants associated with certain functions. Okay, so if the function is written as a sum of functions, indexed by J, then Lji would be the Lipschitz constant of the gradient of function fj in direction i. So, these, so you have as many Lipschitz constants as you have functions multiplied by the number of coordinates. Okay? So you take average of these things, that's this. This is not new. In Nestor's algorithm, it depended on the average of some Lipschitz constants. So that's not new. What is new here is that it depends on the average, data-weighted average, of... of uh, sparsity levels of those functions, okay? So you may have a function which is sum of functions and some of them depend on very few variables and one depends on all of them. Previous results said that the convergence depends on the, on the worst one. Mm -hmm. This result says it depends actually on the average sparsity mm -hmm. pattern. So if you have a least squares problem, this omega j would be the number of non-zeros in a row of your matrix. Previous results on parallel current descent would say that if you have one row, which is dense, 
it's already bad. This result says you just take average of the cardinalities of the rows. If the average is small, it's good. Okay. Fine. So, uh, okay. So again, something that I'm clicking too, too late. Good. Now, let's look at the efficiency of approx. Because I claimed it was efficient in this table, right? So that claim is true, but not always, obviously. You cannot just have a claim like that for any function. So if you have functions of this type, which are very common, let's say, in machine learning, because the sum would correspond to some kind of approximation of expectation, these would be loss functions depending on the data, and the data is encoded in matrix A. Okay? If you have function of this type and A is sparse, then this is efficient. And this is what I mean by this. So let's say this is a sc scalar function and the derivative is computed. If you have this value here in O1 time, assume that, then this is sparse matrix. Then the average cost of one iteration of approx is this. So let's look at what it is. This is number of non-zeros of A, N and Z. It's number of non-zeros in A. So you take the number of non-zeros in A, divided by n. n is the number of columns in A, because that's the number of coordinates. Mm -hmm. So essentially, it's the average number of non-zeros in a column of A multiplied by tau. But this tau is not an issue because you have tau processors that work independently, in parallel. So each processor needs to do as much work as there is average number of non-zeros in the column of A. Okay, that's what this is saying. That's the complexity of one iteration. So of course, if this thing is not sparse, it will be, it will be large. If we have something that is sparse, it will be low. And there's many examples in machine learning, especially, when you have, let's say, columns, the coordinates correspond to examples, and rows correspond to features. And each example depends on only very few features. And it doesn't depend on how many examples you collect. The, these, these number of non-zeros will always be very, very low. It will not grow with the data size. So, so there are data sets of that kind. Okay. Uh, my, my yes. Is, uh, so tau is the number of processors that you have or the number of coordinates you update in parallel. So the more you have processors, uh, the more, more complexity you have. Yes, but this is the, this is the cost of the, this is, okay. this is cost of the iteration. Okay, so you're not winning. So mm -hmm. here, by increasing tau, mm -hmm. you do more work. Yeah. But it doesn't take more time because it's the same amount of work per each additional processor. Mm -hmm. So the saving is not in, so this is actually a very good point because it's counterintuitive. Normally people, what, what they think is when you run more processors, yeah. each iteration is cheaper because you decrease the, it, the, the complexity of one iteration, mm -hmm. not here. So here what you do, you decrease the number of iterations with adding new processors. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Excellent. All right, so this is it. Now, of course, I would need to convince you a little bit why that is true. So, so that's why I have this slide. So first of all, you can get easily convinced that the bottleneck is in the computation of, this par of these partial derivatives, right? Everything else is easy. It's less than this. Now, this is the formula for the partial derivatives in the case of that function that I showed you, okay? Simple formula. So now let's look at this thing. What I claim is that you should be maintaining these products exactly as in the original paper of Nesterov. You maintain these residuals, A, Z, Ks. And let's look how much work is needed to update this residual. So you compute A, Z, K, you look at what happened before, and this is the step in the algorithm. This is just what the algorithm does. And you see that is the previous thing plus this work. Now if A is sparse, this would be cheap. Because you just look at the columns of, of A. So this is maintained, and this is exactly this, this work. This tau divided by n comes from the fact that you're summing up uh, tau random things out of n. And number of non-zeros is just coming from here. So already updating this costs this much. 
But then updating this costs exactly that much. It's just the same, um, same stuff. And now computing this partial derivative is O1 once you have computed these values, which is O1. And computing this whole thing is exactly of this form, so it is again this much. So it's just three times this. This estimation is expected value of... Uh, exactly. So, so expected work per iteration is this. Expected. Yes. And you take expectation of the, of the work because this is random set. Random. Yes. Yes, so this expected work. But if we uh, consider uh, this situation in in sense of probability of large deviation, I guess no uh, uh, I don't know. anything change uh, just a factor of logarithm of okay. 1 divided by sigma with probability uh, yes. greater we than 1 minus sigma. Yeah. I guess this Yes, we, we just didn't looks like probably. Yeah, we just didn't didn't look at that. We we were happy already with this and that's you know, it was good enough for us. And if, uh, we have uh, sum to o over g's. And yes, why, but... Why we don't uh, multiple our complexity of one operation on uh, cardinality of... It is, it is. The number of non-zeros captures that, the cardinality. This, the, it captures that precisely. But if you look at this, for each uh, row of j, yeah. you look only at the non-zeros. Yeah. So that's, that's coming in this non-zero in here. But Yes, yeah. yes, so you have it here, but you also have to sum all of this up, so it's tr three times that work, yeah. right? No, it's, I, I it has exactly the same form. We, we don't need to uh, have non-zero uh, component of R in square. Non-zero in the square, I don't know what, what you mean. Oh, uh, so if this thing is zero, of course you're not going to add it up. That, that's all I'm saying here. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying, that, that's why I'm saying non-zero. If this is zero, the thing in the sum will be zero, you're not going to bother, right? Okay, so this is the chain of thought. This is the same amount of work as this, as adding this up. So it's three times this. And uh, it is significant that you uh, choose, uh, choose the set uh, S, K uh, at random. I, I, I mean the size of set uh, S at random. Maybe uh, the... Uh, no, it can be fixed. The size can be fixed to tau. Cannot be fixed. Can, can. Can, yes. can be fixed. I, I guess it is no... Nothing then uh, simplify the proof. Uh, mm. su such uh, relaxation that the size of the set is not uh, fixed. It simplifies the proof a little bit, yes. In, ah. in fact, we prove it first that way, and then we have a proof for, for this more general one. Or, or maybe to the procedure of randomization uh, looks like simple uh, or cheaper uh, if we allow the, yes. the size of the set. Yes, so, so behind all of this, exactly as you say, there's I didn't tell you yet how you should randomize. I only told you, I only told you that if this thing is satisfied, let, let's go back here. If this thing is satisfied, which I only told you in words yet, and you magically get these Vs, that everything is good. But maybe by engineering this randomization, SK, you can make these Vs go down, mm -hmm. which would just improve the complexity. Or maybe there are functions F, which naturally for any randomization would have Vs small, we, that means they're good for parallel optimization by this algorithm, right? So, and there's also this interaction. You can have a function and then fit to its special randomization where these Vs are small. So my claim is that this is the important thing. This is driving it. So if you can take a function and design this randomization in such a way that this, some of these Vs is small, you're good to go. Is it true that this uh, step, I mean randomization steps, it takes uh, for about n or, or, or large of n uh, operation, elementary uh, arithmetic operation. Well, it is the order of n. Yes, it is. Uh, it is so, n. so we have we have a sampling which is independent sampling. This is a sampling. The one that we implement is the following: each processor picks uniformly at random any coordinate. Okay. Ah, you use and the then parallel, parallel process we use yeah. Using, Even uh -huh. we do it in parallel. Uh -huh. And that thing, if you do it this way, uh -huh. then some processors maybe pick the same coordinate. Uh -huh. Then you let that processor not do anything, okay? Uh -huh. That means that the size of the set grows or shrinks a little bit with certain probabilities. But this is part of this analysis still, because it will still satisfy that ESO thing. Uh -huh. Even that selection, we call it double uniform sampling, that selection is something for which we can give you very good Vs. 
Okay, good. Okay, so I, all right, so let's look at some preliminary experiments. And uh, then, of course, I can go on. I was told that I can go on until like midnight. I mean, Yuri, Yuri promised that. Is, is that true? Yeah. Okay, good. So I have some other things later on, and you just tell me whether you want to hear them or not, which is part of this talk, but I can stop early or I can go on. Okay, no, he, he said I, get, I have two hours, you know. Uh, you up to two hours. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> good. So preliminary experiments. So these are preliminary because uh, they're not really a huge size, and I have huge size experiments later on, but for the version of the algorithm where these theta k's are constant, that's the non-accelerated version. So we didn't do a really huge size for this one yet. But uh, we, do, do you have a slide about, uh, you, you, we, we just talked about how to, uh, how to sample our SK. Uh, yes, that's, that's there. Ah, okay. In the second part, I'll talk about the sampling and all of that. Okay. Yeah, good. So preliminary experiments. So let's look at this. L1 regularized, L1 regression. Mm -hmm. So you have L1 norm of AX minus B plus lambda L1 norm of X. And you want to minimize this. This is a non-smooth. It's non-smooth, double, doubly non-smooth, because you have non-smooth F and non-smooth regularizer. Now we want to keep the regularizer non-smooth, but we approximate this L1 norm using Nestor of smoothing by a smooth function. And then we apply gradient method, Nestor of fast gradient method, smoothed parallel coincident method, which is the non-accelerated one, and then approx. And you can see that approx is doing way better than everything else. And this is on a real data set. And this is small. This has 100,000 columns of coordinates. This is like a baby problem. 800 rows. And this omega is the maximum number of non-zeros in a row of that matrix A, uh, which means this is not very well separable. Sorry, you take this result uh, in uh, uh, one sample uh, of data or? This is one run. Uh -huh. And this uh, is just one. And this, this is a usual uh, thing. This uh, picture is. Yes, that's what you see. That's what you see. It's just that the, the, the variance of this process is very low. It's very difficult to actually, it's not a problem. The variance thing is not a problem here. I see, because I we never observed that. I question about uh, how, how your uh, average of uh, your uh, estimation yeah. of function. No, I'm not averaging anything. This, the, the, the run just looks like this. Okay, nice. Okay, so this, this is better. Okay, so, okay, good. Now, let's look at actual table. Mm -hmm. So you have approx and you have the smoothed parallel coincident method, which is, the, which is exactly approx, but with this theta case constant. So that's that version of it. Uh, and you can see that let's say here you double, when you, when you half the residual, you double the time, right? You double, you double, which means that's one over k, right? So here, when you make this uh, residual into a quarter, you double the time. Mm -hmm. You do double time, double the time. So there's one over k squared. So you exactly see the theory in practice. It's, it's really working that way. But I'm cheating a little bit because in the beginning it doesn't behave that way for some reason. Mm -hmm. Eventually it does. In the beginning you, you don't really see that, but from some point on it behaves like that. Okay. And all data were no, this is matrix. no, no. This is a real data set, Dorothea data set. This is a real data set, machine learning kind of data set. So not not non-random data. Okay, good. So I'll go through this again. Fine. So here's another one. And in this one, essentially the message is that the spiral coincident and approx do about the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, eventually the approx is better, but they do about the same. This is a uh, a little uh, bigger problem. So you actually have 19 million coordinates. That's already something a little bit bigger. And you have 30 million rows. And each, each row of the matrix, you have at most 75 non-zeros. Mm -hmm. So it is very sparse. And uh, we're running on 16 processors. Okay. And what is the data set? Uh, so this is KDDB data set, and uh, I so do not actually know. I do not actually know. Mm -hmm. So my co-author chose this, and I actually do not know. I think it's probably from Plot's kind of collection, but I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. Good. So let's, let's look at uh, training linear, su linear super vector machines. 
So what we do here, we look at the dual problem of the super vector machine, whatever that is. If you know, that's fine. If you don't know, don't worry about it. If you don't know, all you need to know, it's a quadratic minimization problem with bound constraints. That's all. And it's non-strongly convex. So approx is good for it. And SDCA is essentially uh, coordinate descent, uh, serial coordinate descent, non-accelerated. It's called stochastic dual coordinate ascent because it's actually concave maximization. And you can see that it's about twice as fast. And SDCA is the state of the art in machine learning for training super vector machines. So ap approx is better. And this is on a concrete data set, which is very bad for our algorithm. So this is half, but it's very bad because there are rows which are full. And that's exactly when this thing is not supposed to work well. So if we come up with data sets where these things are sparse, this will be much better. But, uh, but we, these are preliminary tests. We don't actually, we didn't actually do it. Uh, is the maximum. The average. Yes, yes. Rows which are uh, relatively selected with very low probability in the remaining time, they are, they are very bad. Yes. So if you, it depends how you choose these VIs. If you use the all theory, the all theory will tell you you should, you should put the omega there and it should be conservative. Now with the new theory, you can actually uh, use the omega j's, which are the, which are the individual sparsities of each row. Uh, and the, the, the sparsity actually here is, is, is pretty good on average in this example. So, so the answer is, is, is going both ways. For the old uh, step sizes, this would be disaster. But the idea that you can, do, you can actually have these theoretically good step sizes is good. And, uh, and, and then, then you get a good result. Good. So. Uh, Fine. So now the question is whether you want me to go on a little bit longer. Yeah, sure. Good. Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, how much time do you want? No, how much time did I talk so far? Let me, uh, tell, tell me. It's uh, uh, one hour. Okay, excellent, good. So, so first of all, I would now like to tell you that this choice of step sizes is really important, these VIs, and I'll give you intuition why these VIs are important, okay? So it's very simple intuition. Uh, first, two boring slides, and then the good slides, OK? So one boring slide is the following thing, that essentially what we've seen today, we've seen this green thing. We got something 1 over square root of epsilon. I didn't talk to you about strongly convex minimization. I didn't talk to you about something when you have difficult non-smooth f and you use it with accelerated by smoothing, even though implicitly we did it with this SPCDM and so on. The point here is that. Uh, coordinate distance methods have this n in there, and by parallelization, you'd like to decrease this n, this dependence on n. So the focus from now on will be on this. How to decrease this? You would like there to be n divided by tau, but there's these v's which then grow. So this is what we would ideally want, but actually what we get, we get some kind of a beta in there, and that beta we would want not to grow with tau. Now the good slides. So this is kind of boring, as I already said it before. So let's have this naive parallelization idea. So do exactly as I did in this 2D example before, but just add up the, the updates. Let's see what happens. So I pick a very particular function. This is a quadratic function, which has minimum here on this diagonal. Okay, so it's like a book which you open up, right? And now let's start here. Uh, is this working? Okay, so I, okay, I'm pressing the wrong button. So this is the function. You start here. At 0, 0, the function value is 1. Here, the function value is 1. And it's 0 everywhere here. So now you think, OK, I know how to do serial coordinate ascent, which is one processor. I go there. And now you think, I have a two-core processor. OK? I will do parallel. So you go there, and you add it up. And you're happy that you have a faster algorithm. But the function value is 1. Nothing improved. Then you do it again, and you go back. This thing diverges. Okay? So you can see on this very simple example, 
parallelization for corner descent is not trivial. You, you cannot just add things up. It depends on the function, whether you can add up or not. Right? You cannot add it up here. Good. So, oops. You know, we're back and so on. It's not good. It's not good. All right, so then you might think, all right, I cannot add things up, so maybe I should average things up, right? Because if you average things up, you go there, you go there, you average that, and you're there in one step. And everything is great. And then you think, I have the solution to the problem. I should average these weights up. And then I give you this function. <laughs> I give you this function, and then you go here, you go there, you average, and essentially, you shouldn't have, right? You should have added things up here, right? Because you add these things up, you're there in one step, and you're averaging. So this is what happens. You just go forever, right? So let's, let's see what happens actually if the same thing, but if you have n dimensions, right? So you go on, you start at 0. The function value is n, right? Just 1 plus n, so on. Now, you can actually write down formula what the function value will be. Just easy, right? And let's require this to be less than the epsilon, so for k, k, and this is k. And you see that you get the n factor there. It's no longer just one step, which would be if you just edit things up, suddenly it's n times something. And that's terrible. You don't want that. So this is why it's very important to figure out what you, whether you should average or not. And that's precisely what the ESO is doing, these v's. They have to be devised in such a way that the function is taken into account, the randomization is taken into account, and you get this interaction there. It cannot be just anything. Good. So this is bad. This is bad. We don't want that. Right. So what should we do? Well, so this is how non-accelerated gradient would look like, gradient descent. And uh, you would like to figure out when this beta can be something like a summation. When beta is equal to n, you're averaging the updates. When beta is equal to 1, you're summing, summing them up. And you don't want to average. But you cannot always add. So the question, which functions are good for adding? And you can already sense that the circular function is good for adding. And why is it good for adding? Because it's separable. These are just in independent problems. So somehow you see already that if you have something maybe which is a little bit less separable, but not completely separable, but, but, but there is some degree of non-separability, but the degree is not high, then maybe you can add up almost. That's why separability is important, and separability will, will be there if you have sparsity in the data. You have any comments or questions? Yes, yes. And here you can see that because you can almost add things up. And you need theory for predicting, for telling you whether you can add it up or not. And that's what the Vs are doing. They precisely tell you whether you add up or average or something in between. Good. And now I'm going to tell you how you get these Vs, okay? Somehow. Well, not exactly, but I'll tell you. So there's five models for admitting, for F, which admits small beta, which means you're almost adding things up which means the v's are small. Now here's one model which uh, we looked at in this paper in the table with, the, with my PGC and Martin Takach. And we assume that these functions have Lipschitz gradients in these individual coordinate directions. This was not our assumption. Nestorov had the assumption in his paper, for instance. Uh, with these different Lipschitz constants Li, the novel thing that we, that we brought into is that we looked at functions which are partially separable, which are written as sum of functions, each of which depends on only few variables. And we looked at omega was the maximum number of uh, coordinates on which one function depended. Okay. There's a different model where you can come up with these v's. The model is you have a non-smooth function of this type, and then you smooth it using Nestor of smoothing, and it turns out, it turns out that is the sparsity of A that governs the good Vs. Again, you define omega this way, maximum number of non-zeros in A, and you, you get the same formulas for Vs as in this case, which is quite surprising. Now you can have F with bounded Hessian. There's another model uh, which originated in this paper in machine learning literature, and then we looked at it in the Hydra paper. 
So you have functions which are upper bounded by this quadratic where the, where the quadratic term is constant, is not changing. When you have this model and many machine learning uh, problems actually satisfy that, then what you should look at is the largest eigenvalue of this matrix. And that, that if that is small, that will mean you have good step sizes. If that is large, it will mean you don't. There's other models. Uh, there's this model and there's this model. And this is the one which, which I claim is new. This is the one with the new step sizes because in this model you look at fj depends on omega j coordinates only and the v's will depend on the average, Who is this? not on the max. Uh, this is uh, myself and Olivier. Mm -hmm. So this is the paper, the approx paper. Mm -hmm. That's where we propose this. So we propose decomposing this function and looking at Lipschitz property of each of these functions in each individual direction. And that's how you get then these good long step sizes. Okay. And now finally the definition of the ESO, mm -hmm. right? So somehow this kind of step is crucial in the algorithm. If you remove the proximal term, this is exactly what's going on. You add up the updates, random updates, and you multiply by this, by this beta, right? That's what happens. So what you would like to do is look at the function value mm -hmm. at the next iterate. Okay, so let's look at what this is. This is a function value of f at x plus h sub s hat. What does it mean? You fix any vector h, you zero out everything that is not in this random set, and just keep the stuff in h which is in the random set. So h s hat is a random vector with many zeros outside of the random set. And you look at the expected value and you upper bound it by this quadratic. And this quadratic depends on beta and w. Okay, this is the, you can put the beta inside the w and call it v. Mm -hmm. Beta times w is the v. Okay, so just different ways of writing it. And so if you have a couple f and s which satisfy this inequality, you, call, you say that they, they admit beta w expected separable over approximation. And you need to be able to compute this before you run the algorithm because this beta and w or the product beta times w which is the v is used as a step size in the algorithm. So you need a whole calculus of being able to compute these betas and w's, right? Good, so this is HS, right? So you just take these random updates and add, add them up. This is just this weighted norm. Good, now why do you think this kind of thing is important? The kind of, this is important because the right hand side is separable. Mm -hmm. It's quadratic, so it's easily minimizable. And you can minimize only those coordinates you care about that are you going to update. So the step size is essentially, the steps are going to be performed by minimizing this right hand side, but only the separable uh, components which correspond to the coordinates that you're going to update. You're not able to do it with the left hand side, but with the right hand side you solve these three problems. So at the same time it's separable, can be minimized in parallel, and you can compute only the updates that you care about. Good, and when you do it, when you minimize this, you get this formula, and that's how you get the step sizes. That's what the algorithm does, okay? Good, and I have some additional stuff, and you can stop me here if you want, or I can go on for a couple more minutes. Okay, so, so now I'll tell you even more about this ESO. So look at the one sampling. One particular sampling is the serial uniform sampling, which means you only update one coordinate at a time, uniformly at random. So this is, you have 12 coordinates, with probably one over 12, you pick this one, probably one over 12, you pick this one, and so on. You can have tau nice sampling, which means you choose tau coordinates, uniformly at random, so this is three. Or you can have doubly uniform sampling, which is a sampling where you first decide what the cardinalities are going to be, with what probability, and then you choose with probably Q3 subset of cardinality three, with probably Q2 subset of cardinality two, and so on. And this is uh, interesting for unreliable processors. Okay, you have these samplings, 
And now there's this theorem, and now you finally know what the step sizes are. So the theorem is under this first model, but you can do it for all these models, and you get some different results, right? Because it always depends on F and S head, on the couple. So I now pick model for F, which is this model number one, and I pick this very particular S head, which is doubly uniform. But for every couple, you have a different V. Then you, you have this expected several over approximation, and the parameters are here. And all of that is easily computable. These are Lipschitz constants, the, in, the initial ones. In a least squares problem, these are the squared norms of the individual columns of the matrix A. So just by reading the data, you have the Li's. Omega is the degree of separability. There's the, there's the, there's the worst case one. And all of this, by design, this is just T, right, essentially. So all of this you know. And now you have the theoretical V. The theoretical V is the product of these Ws and the beta. So that's the V that you put into the approx. The v uh, could not uh, mean something if we, if we have used some more complicated uh, uh, distribution for S. If you use more complicated one, you just have to, again, come up with this inequality. And that has to, uh, that will tell you what Vs you should choose. So this W uniform one. Mm -hmm. Well, the W uniform one, well, I, 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 our motivation was that you get it if, if, if you have unreliable processors. So you don't really implement it. It is implicitly implemented by the processors not being reliable. You ask them to do the work. You ask tau processors. And only some fraction will give you the result. And you're not going to say, I'll wait till they give me. But you say, OK, uh, it is good enough. Okay, so you don't really implement this one. But what you can implement is the tau nice, and we implement it in such a way that we approximate it by this independent one. It's, it's, it's good enough approximation. And this independent one actually turns out to be W uniform. So if independently each processor picks a random coordinate, and you take the union of the thing, it's W uniform. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's another motivation. So that's how you in, in, implement it. You just implement the independent one. It happens to be W uniform. So you know the theory works. And it's par, uh, one that you can generate in parallel. Mm -hmm. So and now what we've done with these new step sizes is that you replace this omega by omega j. And you multiply it by W j. And those are the Vs. So that's the new stuff. So I'm not, I don't have a slide on that. Mm -hmm. But you can already see that the Vs will be much, much smaller. And well, I've got this, so maybe this I will just ignore. What I want to show you maybe is just one, one nice picture here. And this is, OK, this is all theory. But it turns out that in theory and practice, we get the same stuff. So this actual speed up, as you increase the number of processors, how much speed up you get. These are theoretical lines. That's for the non-accelerated version of approx. And in practice, you get exactly the same stuff. So the theory predicts reality for the, for the acceleration really well. So, so I can just go on like this. And uh, now you have an experiment on a 1 billion by 2 billion lasso problem. So now there's something bigger. And you can, OK, so this is some kind of funny picture. So you can see that after you updated about 35 billion coordinates, it doesn't depend whether you have one core, 24 cores, everything converges. Mm -hmm. and, and this is uh, what the. Uh, in Russia, you, s you say that you solve the problem to death, right? Because it's 30 degrees of magnitude, right? It's just solved. The thing is solved. Now, of course, you can then say that, all right, but if I have 24 cores, they work in parallel. Mm -hmm. So if you have 24 cores, in terms of number of iterations, it will be much less. And then you say, OK, maybe number of iterations is not the, 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 the thing that matters. It's the time. But this is the time. So it is about 20 times faster if you have 24 cores mm -hmm. on this problem. But this problem is generated randomly, and it is very sparse. Now I have a distributed version of this, and I'll just show you some, some pictures here. Then you have a distributed sampling, because what you want to do, you want to cut your matrix, the coordinates, and give each coordinates to a different node. So this will be machine one, two, and three. And this is how the sampling will be done. And when you have that new sampling, you need new ESO. You need these step sizes. So you need to compute them. And this is how you compute them. You have another theorem which tells you 
if you have the distributed sampling and this model for the function, then these are the step sizes. And the step sizes depend on how you partition the sigma prime is a property of how you partition the data. And now you may ask, maybe this is going to slow me down too much. And then you say, well, you have this theorem which tells you that if each machine updates at least two coordinates, then this effect of partitioning is smaller than what you had there before, which means that the bit partitioning can at most double the number of iterations. And you can see that one can go on, go on, but I'm essentially done now. So this kind of last slide where I show you that you can have a three terabyte data matrix, which is one billion by half billion. And in about, I don't know, 20 minutes, you solve it. And by solving, I mean Russian style, okay? <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. So these are just some of the papers that I mentioned. Thank you very much. Any questions? Can we uh, partition our, uh, may, maybe our way to partition our data will give us some acceleration, no? In the, uh, I mean, but uh, case when the Hydra works. Well, so for the Hydra, the, ish, the thing with Hydra, the motivation there is that the data matrix is so hot, so big, you, can you uh, cannot store it on a single node. I mean, that's the main motivation. That first of all, you just want to solve it. It's not that you care about how fast it is, you just want to solve it. And then you realize that if you want to do it with a coordinate descent type algorithm, it actually corresponds to this very special sampling. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the step sizes, and then you look at what the theory would predict and it turns out it predicts that the number of iterations depend very weakly on how you partition, which then means that you can design the partitioning to minimize the communication cost, and you don't have to worry about the number of iterations. And what is the source of uh, this data? Because if you can, if you can um, uh, take your data to, data to one computer, then uh, how you partition it? Yes, well, well, the thing is that you probably just, I mean, in, 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 in Google, let's say, so they just store it in a distributed way. They would just never put it on, on a single. So the data would be stored that way. And they have to decide how do they store it. Do they store it by examples? Mm -hmm. Or do they store it by partitioning the features? They decide, then they store it in a distributed way. They have to then operate on it, maybe using Hadoop, but in a distributed way. But, but when, when we think about the structure of this uh, yes. data, what we know is uh, that it's sparse. And uh, m maybe, uh, is, is there any works on our uh, structures that are used, like uh, if uh, this data was generated by, some, by a hack or something? I do not have a good answer for that. So here the sparsity is, is really, really important for these types of algorithms. No, and I, mean, I think that, seems to, be, that seems to be just one of the ways, mm -hmm. but th there don't seem to be many other ways in which you can solve really, really huge scale things. Mm -hmm. because unless there's some intrinsic small scale phenomenon there. And the small scale thing is that actually it's sparse. So somehow it's embedded in a huge dimension, but the real thing, the real action is some, in some small dimensional space and it's governed by the sparsity. And then the algorithm should discover that and operate on that small dimensional thing. I mean, not that, uh, so sparsity is important in that sense, I, but I do not know. No. Yes. Maybe there's something else uh, that you can uh, also use uh, in on sparse data. Well, there is this uh, beautiful algorithm by Nesterov, a subgradient uh, or primer dual LP solver, which uses the sparsity of the gradients, of the subgradients. There's a beautiful model for utilizing sparsity in a completely different way. details about this last huge problem yes. billion by billion. Yes, so this problem is artificially constructed because we just didn't have access to real data of that size and it comes from stochastic optimization. So it is uh, in this block angular form, there are these blocks and then there is their coupling constraints at the end. That's how it looks like. But do you use I'd a gray computer? For this, we used uh, the Hector uh, supercomputer, which used to be the first, the largest in one in the, in, the, in the UK. Now it's the second one because we have a new one. And uh, we run it on about, I think, 2,000 
uh, course. Something like this. It's not a GPU implementation. We also have GPU implementations of some of these algorithms. It run on about 2,000 uh, cores. I don't think, it's written somewhere here, right? Uh, 2,048 cores. So this was a smaller version of it when this poster was created. And you can see maybe, okay, the structure of the data matrix is not there. Okay. Yeah, it is here, right? So these 128 nodes for MPI processes and so on. Okay. Very yes. impressive. <laughs> Thank you. You are considered um, dual function, uh, and first term of this function is a sum function. Yes. Uh, did you consider an analog of the function? For example, um, the first term is a maximum function. I that every so I think that that's exactly that paper by Nesterov, which I, which I talked about. He considered that, and it's a beautiful work. Mm -hmm. And that the sparsity of subgradients is driving the algorithm, and it works amazingly well. Logarithmic dependence on the dimension and so on. I didn't, con well, well, I have some ongoing work, but there's nothing else out there. We consider a different uh, uh, model, where you have a function of a sum of functions. In that case, you can do some sketching ideas so that, that's ongoing work. And uh, what about uh, some uh, functions that uh, could not be uh, you know, uh, decomposed uh, su such a, in such a uh, beautiful way, like some uh, for, for example, they, they have uh, some uh, variables which are used on every function in this sum. Well, that's exactly, that is this model. So this is sum of functions, but the functions uh, share some variables. Okay, so it's not a decomposed. No, no, I mean, but, uh, they share some variables. I, I mean that, uh, just like you said, that yes. there's a uh, column uh, which are not sparse at all. Which are cool. so one column. No, no, no. Uh, that's the example that you said when uh, uh, you give us complexity. Yes, um, yes. Analysis. Okay. And what about uh, when there's a not one, but uh, many. many. Well, what I, I can say you that it depends on the average. So if there's too many, too many would be that the average mm -hmm. of them is large. And you then this algorithm cannot do anything better. Where was the example when uh, you try your algorithm on uh, uh, full, full matrix? And yes. everything uh, still works uh, better? Yes, the, the, theory, the theory works still. It's just that each iteration will be much more expensive and uh, there be more iterations? No, just uh, we saw it where your algorithm uh, behave uh, better than uh, the best one, which I used uh, for now. So the answer is maybe your algorithm is uh, uh, optimal not only for sparse, but uh, for area. Uh, this, is, this, this, this work was preliminary, the, the computational work, so I can't really conclude <coughs> Conclu conclusively let's say anything, mm -hmm. but, I, I, um, but we're excited because we think that uh, it will really be uh, running, running well on some problems, such as the dual of the super vector, mm -hmm. vector machine problem. But there are other problems where other types of algorithms uh, would work better, such as stochastic gradient descent type algorithms, uh, such as the stochastic variance reduced gradient or the stochastic average gradient or the S2GD algorithm. The, this is different line of research, which is, which is uh, equally exciting, I think. And uh, in, in about two weeks, I'll be in, in a workshop uh, in uh, Los Angeles and be full of talks of that type on stochastic gradient algorithms. And, and there'll be all kinds of uh, approaches. So this is one of the approaches. The, the, there are others. So somehow, this, this approach somehow implicitly reduces the variance mm -hmm. of the of the gradient. So that's why it works well. This is maybe one connection. Um, can you say anything about uh, the most optimal uh, estimates of convergence? We didn't work on any lower bounds for this. Oh. I have no idea. As, as soon as you introduce randomization, things, things are different. And for, for instance, there's this algorithm, a stochastic average gradient. Which, 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 which is, just works amazingly well. Uh, and, uh, 
and, and it beats the theoretical complexity bounds, uh, which didn't use randomization of algorithms that didn't use randomization. So there's lots of exciting um, opportunities and possibilities. Whereas uh, uh, your your randomization gives uh, some some effect on uh, simulation bounds uh, only when you optimize in some adaptive way because uh, uh, every stochastic um, every randomization which uh, uh, could be done before you run your algorithm could be uh, yes uh, yeah, possess like a yes it's an important open problem as far as I know mm -hmm. adaptive choice of these probabilities there are some approaches I have supervised one uh, master's thesis a couple years ago and there's 11 algorithms in that thesis different approaches but there's not really much theory in there mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's an open problem to come up with an adaptive way where the probabilities actually help the algorithm. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is easy to, to write down a theorem which says you do it adaptively and you get this complexity, but it, it will be worse mm -hmm. than this one. Peter, and about these curves, uh, are, they in this. Uh, yeah. are they in agreement with theoretical uh, results? Why should this fast uh, 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 this so this is not the fast slope of this curve why it changes so first of all this is not the fast uh, method this is the one where these theta k's are fixed mm -hmm. so this is that version of the approx which we call PCDM mm -hmm. that's one thing and it's the distributed version of it so it's actually Hydra so distributed version of PCDM is Hydra and it's asynchronous implementation so we depart from the theory already. So we, we do some, some magic there. So, so what we do is that when these nodes compute residuals, we don't broadcast the residuals to everybody as the theory would assume that we should, but we send them in a, in a ring. Mm -hmm. So everybody has some delayed information. It turns out it still works and it works better. So this is, this is uh, asynchronous streamlined, reduce all, so this is the asynchronous version, just, just better mm -hmm. than, the, uh, than the one which is not asynchronous. Uh, why the do they look like this? I the shape of these curves, uh, why they change this slow? So there's some kind of local convergence going on at the end, which, which we do not predict really well. We do not know. So our theory doesn't predict the local convergence why, over there. Why it happens? So, uh, because you're close, you're close to you're close to solving it, and this is a this problem. I think is either close to being strongly convex or it is strongly convex. So, first of all, you would expect linear convergence, because if you look at this, you have more rows than columns in the matrix. So, if you do ATA, it will probably be strongly convex. The smallest eigenvalue will probably be positive, but the change of slopes, I have no theory for predicting that. No, no idea. I don't have any. There must be some works out there which tell you how these things behave locally, but uh, I haven't studied that. Mm -hmm. So it's strange that locally it's much faster yes. than global. Yes. Well, there's some kind of second order thing going on in there, right? Because these, these weights are diagonals of the Hessian. So you already have some second order information. Though, so it's conceivable that that some acceleration will happen locally, but uh, we, we just have not studied that. Mm -hmm. So it'd be very interesting to study that. You are very lucky that. Uh, uh, yes, so I mean, this, this was our kind of second plot. So we, we were not picking. So the one that we had before was just smaller size. You know, this also going down. This one, we cut it soon, mm -hmm. right? So we just increased the size here from one terabyte to three terabytes. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you for all the questions.